to introduce our first speaker, Richard Rubin. Richard has been active for six years in a support group for younger spouses of people with dementia. His wife, Rebecca Bernard, was diagnosed with dementia in 2006 at the age of 53. Richard is going to tell the story of his wife and how he has cared for her. Richard. I want to thank uh, Carl Craver, whose idea this symposium was, and for his ongoing advice, and Jeff Dower, who introduced uh, the program for all his work in organizing the symposium, Kimberly Mount, the, the PNP administrative assistant, and also uh, Ron Mallon, the director of the PNP program, who made the funding for this possible and also the other speakers whose presentations I look forward to. And I'll have more acknowledgments at the end. This photograph, which suggests a mind starting to come apart, is a self-portrait taken and hand-reworked by my wife, Rebecca Barnard, around 1992, about 12 years before the signs began to appear that showed that her mind actually was coming apart. Sometime last fall, 2000, Beck looked at me, and in a rare moment of obvious recognition, her eyes caught mine, and she said, sad, sad, sad. That she would say anything is remarkable, for most of her speech is intelligible only by a linguistic and literary genius. Even more remarkable is that she was still able to know what has happened to her to us and assess its emotional weight. Yes, Rebecca Barnard's story is a sad one, but I mean to push beyond the sadness and let her story probe the limits of what it is to be human. More than half a century ago, here is the little girl then known as Becky Barnard at the age of five or six. Here's Becky at 23. By this time, she had graduated from Washington University with a BA in music. She was working for the music department and studying for a master's degree in English. I met her four years earlier, 1972. She was 19. Here she is at the age of 40. By then, she was going by Beck. Like me, she ended up in information technology as a way to earn a living. But it was not her driving passion. She became a serious fine art photographer. This photo, which she took of herself, shows her determination and sense of who she was. Here are some of her other pictures. When she was shooting, she did not want anyone nearby. Don't talk. Don't be seen, she told me. She also said, when I am with my camera, it is as if the world were giving me all these gifts. Beck loved collecting things when I realized that her visits to thrift shops never seemed to stop. I asked her, Beck, what primordial urge are these visits that you go on all the time? What primordial urge are they satisfying? And without a moment's hesitation, she answered, hunting and gathering. <laughs> Another time, she said, well, I'm just training my eye. And her eye was her own. Beck was uninfluenced by fashion or convention. She celebrated the eth efforts of others to make beauty in their lives, the decorations they placed in their homes. Even if those efforts were clumsy, she somehow managed in her photography to make something even more beautiful out of them. In museums, she never wore headphones because she wanted to look at paintings and other objects without filters. And she always insisted that the street was the best museum. In 1997, after my divorce, Beck and I start seeing each other. Four years later, in 2001, we marry. The next year, 2002, we are both out of work, and Beck moves in with me. She lost her job in the first mass layoff in A.G. Edwards history. She had worked there 11 years. I suspect part of the reason was her incipient dementia. In, 
In 2003, Beck is still shooting pictures but not working. She has no dark room anymore. I print this picture for her digitally, even though she thought digital photography was the Antichrist. And it wins a contest at the Missouri Botanical Gardens. The urge to take pictures continues for some time into her illness. Late in February 2008, Beck and I stay with her uncle Angus in Sacramento, California. Beck always has her camera with her. She knows that she has a show coming up in May. Maryville University gave her a retrospective of 20 years of her work. But back in California, 2008, uh, uh, in February of that year, her sense of space is puzzling. If you draw two points on a, on a piece of paper and ask her to guess where the midpoint is, she has no idea. Her concept of geographic relations San Francisco to Berkeley, Berkeley to Oakland, is almost non-existent. Yet, she composes photos with deliberate, oops, got a backup one. She composes photos uh, with deliberation and knows what a good picture looks like. She takes a picture of me and, and Angus that shows that her eye is still remarkable. Look, she cuts off a portion of my head the way a casual photographer might not have, but that is characteristic of many of Beck's photographs. And here, the concentration, I almost said focus, but the concentration is on the scene as a whole. In 2004, Beck still has no work. She doesn't seem to have it together even to apply for a job. I think she is depressed. She says it's hormonal, the effects of menopause. We go to therapy together. In the spring of 2005, Beck sees my father on the stairs in my mother's house on Long Island. It is during a reception following his memorial service. He has been dead three months. By summer's end, she repeatedly forgets to close car doors. In the fall, she is sitting next to the coffee pot. Our friend Dwight and I are drinking coffee. I ask her to refill my cup. She asks several times, which is your cup? and then pours it in the wrong one. She parks her car at an angle in the, uh, at, uh, at an angle in the garage so that I have to repark it to get my own in. At the end of the year, in New York, she gets on the wrong commuter train. I pick her up at another station, drive back to the station where we left the car for her. She doesn't return to the house when I do. I call her cell phone. Where are you? I ask. I don't know. She's crying. Beck, is there a street sign? Beck, is there a street sign? Uh, 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 yes. What does it say? What's the sign say, Beck? Dead end. Three months later, Dr. A, <coughs> Dr. A, a gastroenterologist, is sent back to the Washington University Memory Diagnostic Center, where she sees Dr. B, a neurologist, on her 53rd birthday, the 6th of April, 2006. The diagnosis is severe cognitive loss of undetermined origin. He orders her not to drive. She says she can live with that as long as it's not progressive. In the summer, a second memory diagnostic center neurologist, Dr. C, nails the lid of the coffin. He writes, dementia on the whiteboard in large letters. Beck says, my life is over. An awkward pause follows. The doctor is no longer sure of himself. He says, well, your, your, your life is not over. The silence is unbearable. Dr. C cannot tell whether she has Lewy body, frontotemporal, or Alzheimer's, or something else. To this day, we still don't know, but the word Alzheimer's is burned into Beck's brain. I convince her to go to a session at the Alzheimer's Association called Getting Connected. The nurse running it makes a point of emphasizing that Alzheimer's is a fatal disease for which there is no cure. The panelists discuss problems in advanced stages like incontinence. In the car, afterwards, Beck starts to scream. They are the loudest I've ever heard. 
She would drown out Niagara Falls. No, her screams would suspend the falls in midair as though time had stopped. I have Alzheimer's. I have Alzheimer's. Oh, God, why didn't you tell me? Oh, God, oh, God, what will I do? What will I do? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? Time suspended itself, unsuspended itself, and half an hour later, in the food court in the gallery, Beck says, rather calmly, I guess that was my first primal scream. You know, I don't, I'm not sure why I was screaming. I already knew I had Alzheimer's. For more than two years, Beck is at home, but becomes more and more dependent. By the end of 2007, she needs help dressing, bathing, and even using the toilet. We go to Baltimore for a philosophy conference, and there's Beck at the Baltimore Art Museum. We attend a session on cognitive loss and ethics. A young professor presents a case like that of a woman faithful to her husband all her life who starts an affair with a man in her nursing home. Very common, happens in, my, uh, in the uh, home where Beck is now, the Riverview. Um, so the question is, should she be stopped? She's been faithful to her husband all her life. The speaker asks it this way. Should you honor the wishes of a person in the early stages of dementia after she ceases to be a person? Beck whispers to me. She doesn't know what she's talking about and then asks to go to the bathroom, her way of saying, get me out of here. During the discussion, the audience members are polite. They refrain from raising the specter of the Nazis or the Ku Klux Klan, but the outrage is palpable. One man says that people with profound cognitive, cognitive loss deserve to be called persons in honor of the capacities they once had, even if they can no longer do anything. And I'd suggest that there's a lot more to it than that. I learned later, to my dismay, that this pernicious use of the word person is frequent in current American philosophic discourse. A year later, Beck has twice been in hospital psychiatric units. The doctors have tried numerous powerful antipsychotic medications and electroconvulsive shock therapy. I am, I am struggling to keep her at home. Once she asked me if there was about a year before that she'd asked me, is there something wrong with me? And I told her, nothing that will make me go away from you. And now, she resists. I'm trying to keep her at home, and she's resisting taking her med medications. She thinks of them as a sign that there is something terribly wrong with her. In desperation, I, I hold her head in, in, in my arms and try to force the medicine into her mouth. She backs away from me, strikes her head on a wall phone, which crashes to the floor. She holds her injured head and wails. Oh, sweetie. Oh, sweetie. I'm just a person. I'm just a person. And then she walks into the living room and says, Oh, sweetie. Oh, sweetie. I'm in a mad place. Beck's assertion of her own humanity was a rebuke not just to the philosopher, but to me as well. I was stunned at what the disease had led me to do. And it is also re a rebuke to anyone who turns away and won't look at her as she is, especially professionals who should know better, who should know better but let her condition prevent them from seeing her. When Dr. B, the first neurologist, ordered a four-hour battery of psychometric tests, Beck sat in the psychologist's office afterwards, visibly distressed by how much she could no longer do. She couldn't, for example, draw a clock and put the numbers in it. In fact, they all went to one side and not in the right order. <coughs> the psychologist talked to me as if Beck were not there. Remember the second neurologist, the one who did not quite know what to say when Beck said her life was over except to tell her she was wrong. Now, 
I recognize that letting someone know that he or she has a dreadful, incurable disease may be the hardest thing a physician has to do. But nevertheless, he let his professional demeanor stop him from offering her sympathy. Now, I know that Beck has received good care, often superb care, from dedicated doctors, nurses, therapists, aides, volunteers, many of whom perform their jobs not just with skill, patience, and determination, but also with obvious love. Our next speaker, Peggy Suabo, was able to calm Beck down at a moment of the highest anxiety just by knowing how to touch her. No aide or nurse who is committed to her work with dementia patients or his work um, would ever question whether those he or she assists every day eating, walking, washing, taking medicine, toileting, overcoming fear are people. Yet sometimes the disease seems to overwhelm suppos supposedly more sophisticated professionals because there is nothing they can really do. So they fall back on old habits of thought. In mid-August 2008, Beck's precipitous decline began with an especially difficult weekend. At times she was inconsolable and I, I became convinced she needed medical attention. At night, I tried to go to bed. Beck stayed up. She wandered from room to room, bellowing and crying, I have to leave. I have to get out of here. I want to go home. Somebody help me. She ended up downstairs, sprawled across the bed of her mother, who was visiting. She told her mother, I tried to make it work. I tried, but I can't anymore. Richard needs somebody else. By the time we reached the psychiatrist's office a few days later, Beck was stopping people in the lobby saying, help me, help me, my husband's crazy. The psychiatrist, Dr. D, said Beck was obviously psychotic and needed to be admitted right away. The word psychotic seemed as if it were a word from a foreign language. Yes, I thought, Beck is misperceiving things, but that's because her brain is de deteriorating, and more than that, her misperceptions are driven by a fear that something terrible is happening to her. And it, and it is. There's a monster inside her head, and it's real. That was August. Two days before Christmas, I did what I swore I'd never do, and placed Beck in a nine-resident assisted living facility, Shoots Manor, one of the Dolan homes. Two days later, Christmas Day, I drive her to her brother's house. On the highway, the trees, buildings, and sky move past the window. The neurons are flying, she says. The neurons are flying. I want to tell you about a remark made by Beck's primary care doctor, Dr. A, the one who initially referred her to the Memory Diagnostic Center. He made this about nine months after she started living here in Schutz Manor. But this remark needs some background. By April, she had started to lose the ability to walk. And by September, when she saw Dr. A, she spent her days in a geriatric broader chair, something like a, a recliner on wheels. Even more important is that her language was changing because Dr. A commented on something she said. Now, language was not Beck's initial loss. The neuropsychologist who determined that her visual, spatial, and executive function deficit were severe said her language was above average, although at the time, for Beck, that may have been a degradation. Here are some of the things that Beck said when she was in the hospital for the first time. This is in August 2008. I still want to be at Washington University around people are doing there. Can you figure it out? I need my education back. Now these remarks, though indirect, are not that hard as Beck asked to figure out. 
She was losing what she was and what she could do. The education she had received was slipping away. She said things like, it's that I can't do it the same way I used to be able to. But here's a remark that might puzzle a doctor who did not have the context and lead him or her to think that she was talking nonsense. I have to look, now she's in the hospital when she says this, I have to look and see what has happened with the cat and not be unpleasant. Can you make that your very most? There's much captured in this fragmented utterance. She is away from her beloved cat princess, whom she rescued from a frigid winter years before, and who has been a source of comfort as her illness has grown worse. She wants to know if the cat is okay. She doesn't want the cat to be frightened. The whole hospital confinement has been unpleasant in back senses that she herself may have been unpleasant. It, it doesn't matter who the president is or what the season is, the question the doctors ask. What matters is that she is losing who she is and can't stop it. I'm so stupid, I could die. I've got to get out of here. Here is where her mind is. Her image of herself is as a, is as a smart person. I'm going to die, I'm dying. Doctor, doctor, please help me. That was in September 2008. In January, soon after she moved into Schutz Manor, I began to record her speech. That was while she was still walking. And here's a sample of what she sounded like. Oh, oh sweetie, sweetie, stay with me. Stay with me, please. You have, you have nice shoes. You have nice shoes, sweetie. I want, I want my husband. I am in love with my husband. My husband, my husband, my husband, my husband. Sweetie, 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 sweetie. I just tip you. I just tip you. I just tip you, and it's perfect. But it's not. That's not. By the time we get to Dr. A, the following September, Beck is no longer walking and her speech is even more fragmented. Dr. A listens to her talk with utter amazement. It's astounding, he says. What can happen when the brain stops working as it should? Oh, okay, I say, but, but watch this. I turn to Beck and ask, Beck, do you like me? Like you? Like you? Richard, I love you! Hmm, says the doctor. But she has no idea what she is saying. This is a, this is a good doctor, a caring doctor, a smart doctor. But this remark brought home how much theory, how much one's assumptions about a disease can blind you to the person sitting in front of you. Beck was not quiet, yet he didn't notice that she had changed the word like to love. She was very much attuned to the semantic content of what she was saying and the emotion it conveyed. I started recording Beck at the behest of a psychiatrist, Abolish Desai, then at St. Louis University, who said little work had been done on the speech of dementia patients, but he was sure it was not just a word salad, as it is often characterized. Over the past four years of listening to Beck, a number of persistent themes have become apparent, have become apparent in the phrases that break through her patter into intelligibility. Chief among these are love, life, and loss. About a month after the doctor said she had no idea what she was saying, in the fall of 2009, Beck turns to me and says, Richie, she never called me that before, Richie, Richie, I, I was life. In January, a few months later, I catch her on video, it's a crude video, uh, well I'm going to let her say it for me and I've thought a long time about showing this in public, but in the context of this talk, it makes sense. Tick, tick, 
I had never asked before. Do you want to die, Beck? I say it slowly and then repeat it. Do you want to die? I can easily imagine her saying yes. She stares for about a minute, not looking at me. I'm not sure she understood the question. Then she turns toward me and says, I love life, diddle, diddle, daddy, love life, love, love, diddle, diddle, love, 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 love. That took my breath away. Three months later, Beck is sitting with a nurse who is trimming her nails. And Beck says, I am life. Shortly after the beginning of this clip, and at the end of the clip, she sees me with a video camera and recognizes me. The nurse is Nina Brethauer of BJC Hospice. Nina is an excellent example of someone who knows how to deal with dementia patients. Beck seems amazed to find herself still alive. He still, I still, I still left, still left, still left. No. Daddy, what's it, what's it, what's it, what's out, 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 out. You got a strong grip there, lady. Do you know that? What? I said, you've got a strong grip. What's it? <laughs> Two and a half years later, last October, Beck is with a physical therapist who is using a stand-up frame to place her in an upright position. The therapist is Chris Pettit. How's that? Chris is another professional who knows how to look past the distress and the loss. Can I go up a little bit higher? Yeah. I'm gonna go all the way straight. The stand-up frame <laughs> provokes some vocal energy on Beck's part. But her speech is less fluid and coherent than in the previous video. It's even harder to form words, and yet her impulse to say something is unremitting. Then she glimpses me. Same idea as the prior video, but with fewer, more strained, and even more desperate words. A year ago, my grandson, who will be three in July, was at about the same language level as Beck was then. But there's a big difference. Beck is not a toddler discovering the magic of language, struggling to find words she hasn't quite mastered, but someone who remembers what it was like to express herself clearly. Not that she can recall any specific instance of doing it, but she feels it deep inside and finds it painfully hard to formulate the ideas that her inner urges promote. As Beck continued her long, slow decline, now, now that she was in the nursing home, it slowed down, a guardian angel arrived. Shortly after Beck started at living at her current nursing home, the Riverview, 
A woman in her 90s named Willie Ethel Brantley began dining at the table next to Beck's. She and I started talking, and I introduced her to Beck. Hello, Beck, she said, leaning from her own standard wheelchair in the Beck's large Brody chair. Well, Beck doesn't say much, I explained, but if you talk to her, she'll know you're there, and she'll hold on to you. She's quite strong, so maybe from time to time you can talk to Beck and hold her hand. So Miss Brantley said, oh, I knew God put me here for a reason. And since then, she has talked to Beck two or three times a day, every day. She knows how to be soothing and insistent at the same time. And here's an example of Miss Brantley persuading Beck to sit up straight. And uh, the noise you'll hear is Beck's teeth grinding. Good, Beck. It was good. That was nice. That was just beautiful. I told you you could do it. A more remarkable incident, which I also witnessed, occurred about a year and a half ago. Uh, at that time, Beck's left arm was curled up in, in an awkward manner. The arm has since responded to physical therapy and continues. Um, with uh, maintenance exercises to remain uncurled. Miss Brantley was trying to show me that Beck could use her left arm if encouraged to do so. She proceeded to gently exhort Beck in a manner similar to that uh, I showed you in the video. And Beck did not appear to be listening, but after five minutes of hearing, come on, Rebecca, use your left hand, show your husband how, you, how smart you are. Come on, no, Richard, don't help her. No, not your right hand, your left hand. Show your sweetie you can use your left hand. Beck said, oh, for goodness sake, and raised her left arm. <laughs> Miss Brantley had a stroke almost 60 years ago in her 30s from which it took her three years to recover. I know what it is, it is like, she says, to want to say something and not be able to. Now she is convinced that Beck will get better, that she will walk and talk and take pictures again. Beck's mother, who is here with us today and visits Beck three t times a week, uh, have tried to tell Willie Brantley that Beck is not going to be get better. Her reply is, you're not talking to the doctor I'm talking to. <laughs> now, I don't share Miss Brantley's religious optimism, nor her vocabulary, but she doesn't appear to hold that against me. <laughs> and she is broad-minded enough to know that you can do Jesus' work without using his name, and for my part, I very much favor what has resulted in a devotion that enables her to see Beck more clearly than most others and to foster whatever capacity and humanity she has left. Miss Brantley is Beck's in-house advocate. If she finds an AIDS treatment of Beck to be inadequate, Miss Brantley will tell her so and say, just because she doesn't talk doesn't mean she doesn't have a voice because as long as I'm here, she's got one. Now, I suspect that Miss Brantley over-interprets some of the things Beck says, but I have come to realize that over-interpretation is better than under-interpretation, and many times I know that Miss Brantley has understood Beck exactly. I have another story about Beck and Ethel Brantley. Ethel is the name she was known by um, most of her life from the time she was nine years old. 
But I'm going to tell this story in the context of Beck's uh, continuing playfulness. Now, here's Beck in the summer of 2010. She's been at Schutz Manor, uh, her first um, uh, uh, residence outside the home for a year and a half. Her stepmother and her father are getting ready to leave from a visit. Her father, who is who has since died of complications of Alzheimer's, tries to give her some advice. Watch Beck's eyes. Be a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> Now, once, when Miss Brantley was ill, I wheeled Beck into her room. Beck saw her in bed and started fussing. I moved Beck's chair close to the bed, and the two of them started entwining their hands and stroking each other. It's okay, Rebecca, said Miss Brantley. I, I, I just have a headache. I'll be better. The next morning, at breakfast, Miss Brantley wheels herself close to Beck in the dining room. Hi, Beck. It's your friend, Willie. Beck said one of her rare words. Sick. No, said Willie. That was yesterday. I'm better today. There was silence for a while. And then Beck said, I love you. Oh, said Miss Brantley. You know that I love you, but I never dreamed that you would say that to me, say such a thing to me. And Beck said, you're so dumb. <laughs> I want to conclude with Beck, not as she is now, but as she was in, during the first year after her diagnosis, when I thought I was living in a Marx Brothers movie when uncanny associations emerged from her with such spontaneous fluidity as to leave me dumbstruck. Beck stands outside the bathroom with her underwear and silk leggings down below her knees. She complains that she, she's having trouble getting them off. So, well, try sitting down, I say. There's no place to sit. Well, we're right outside the bathroom. I said, what about the toilet? It's a toilet. Oh, I shrug. I realize that there's no point in arguing, so I go to another room, bring a chair back, place it in front of her, and say, sit. That holds her arms up and goes, woof, woof. <laughs> oh, I apologize. Perhaps my lady would prefer to sit in this chair that I have brought her. That's your ladyship, she said. <laughs> and it will come in soon. <laughs> I just want to thank many of the people who have helped care for Beck and for me uh, over the past seven years. I'll just mention a few. Vicki Bales, who was the manager of the first nursing home, uh, or it's actually assisted living facility that Beck was in. Vicki is now suffering from lung cancer. Um, Beck's family, uh, I mentioned her mother who's sitting here, who, who visits Beck uh, three times a week. Her sister Vic sitting next to her mother right here, uh, who comes and sees Beck uh, occasionally on Saturdays, and her niece uh, Emma Brown. Um, uh, people who helped me review this presentation, including my daughter Maggie Diamond, uh, and of course, I want to thank um, Rebecca and Willie Ethel Brantley, who made the effort to come here today and is sitting right over there.